welcome to our class here at Neo Comfortable Race and Design. It's Daniel the same with the story. Uh, with us is a very enthusiastic group of young students. Uh, they're all part of this really great program called Green Boundaries. Um, I don't want to get into the mechanics of that, um, but um, we are so glad you're here today. Uh, second week of school it feels like a month has gone by, um, but we sort of just started out talking about using um, law and Johnson. Oh, right. So we started with a federal court opinion out of Ferguson, the five second rule, the moving rule, and we kind of asked you all to look at a cold impressions and we unpacked the mechanics of the legal opinion and citing precedent and words and descriptions, storytelling. Storytelling. Uh, then we sort of looked at images and the role of images in protest um, and walked through some principles that people have to understand images and read them and interpret them. And so that sort of leads us into this week where we sort of start to uncover storytelling and the stories behind a lot of these images that are told, who the people are that are telling these stories, why they're telling these stories, and the kinds of stories they want to tell, uh, and how design plays a role in that um, narrative, either for good or for bad. And so that brings us to you today, uh, being a storyteller that uses multiple kinds of media to tell stories. So Danny is super talented. Uh, once computer science major in turn creative um, storyteller and writer. He, uh, whether it's behind the lens making films or uh, taking photos or using poetry, songwriting. Um, he has mastered the art of telling stories, uh, stories of different audiences of different people, stories that are not the stories that you always see um, portrayed in the media, but stories that are deep and um, that have a lot um, that they carry. So we're honored today to hear from you and hear about your experiences, um, doing the work that you do, and hopefully you can back into some of the work in Ferguson. So the way it's pretty informal, so Danny will sort of share with us and talk about um, some of the photos that he's taken and why, and we will sort of jump into a little bit of a Q&A. You all are welcome to think about questions you might want to ask him. I will have a dead stop um, of this at Exactly. Is that all correct? Uh, I'm going to have to do that first. That's like what we want. Oh, that's right. It's too late. I'm like, what is going on? It's an hour back. Yes, so we will um, do this until 325 at the very next. <coughs> Don't look at the and then, and then, just a preview of where we're going. At yes. the end, the back end of this class, Professor Laker is going to start with the introduction to frame, sort of the, the general ideas of design. And then next week, next week, yes, yes, next week, we're going to uh, introduce the intersection of law and design, which is a whole movement based largely out of Stanford that tries to bring these two ideas together. And then we'll do a little bit of the Constitution. So your reading for Monday is. A little bit of the law and design stuff and the Constitution. You don't have, there's not going to be a Socratic cold calling about Article 3 of the Constitution or anything, so don't try to memorize it. Just try to get a general sense of what's going on. But, you know, in, in, as you did with the other case, what stands out? What seems hard to understand? What seems crazy about it? And then we're going to jump in uh, on the back end of next week into some, some of the St. Louis based cases having to do with race based discrimination in housing. And then uh, we'll spend a few classes starting with the law side and then trying to figure out how we can unpack and get into the stories behind them. And a quick note, housekeeping for the vlog. Thank you all for that have commented in the vlog. It's really good <coughs> to see uh, and hear your voices come through. Uh, well, we are thinking of a very consistent strategy for that. So we are going to require you to, in uh, every two weeks, to comment on the vlog post and then comment on someone else's comment. So you're doing two things. Every two weeks, you're writing a comment on a blog post, and then you're commenting on a comment. Does that make sense? We'll send out a reminder. We'll send out a reminder, and we keep reminding you every time uh, the blogs go up. So, all right, without further ado, let's welcome Danny to the class.
Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Danny. Um, so I guess my government name is Danny Boyd. So if you like Google me, you'll find one thing. But then also I go by Danny B as a performing artist. And I've been doing performing arts for the past 12 years. And the first thing that I can tell you is that the first five seconds are always the most awkward. Because it's like, I don't know any of the people that I'm talking to. I don't know how they're going to receive what I'm about to say. Um, and it's just awkward. That's just honest truth. So we've gotten past the first five seconds. So it's not awkward. <laughs> um, so um, I guess to give you a little bit of a rundown. Um, so I first got into, I guess, the, the act or the craft of storytelling back when I was in high school. Uh, when I was a junior in high school, me and some of my friends, we used to do battle rapping before school every morning. And so one day I had the idea to record it. I'm like, hey, you know, it's, it's like back in 2002 or something like that. Like, I don't know how old you all were. But um, I said, hey, you know, if I have a video camera, I could record this and I could turn it into a movie or something that we can go back and watch and see a narrative. And so that was my first start. And then I eventually got to college and I began studying creative writing with the focus on poetry and journalism. And so with that, I kind of had this duality of creativity and also the use of narrative. Uh, the creativity come from poetry, wanting to use colorful words that sound pretty, and the narrative coming from journalism, which is essentially about storytelling from more so a factual standpoint. And pretty much just started and liked it, kept going, finished college, all that good stuff. And so when I got into doing it professionally, I would say I actually started with photography, which is it's always awkward being like multi-talented because people are like, well, how does all this fit together? Well, that's kind of what I'm trying to explain now. So, uh, so I wrote for KDHX. So uh, anybody familiar with KDHX? Oh my God, this is Um. So KDHX is a community media station. So are you familiar with like Hot 107 or like the big mainstream radio stations? Mm -hmm. So they're basically the indie station. So instead of being like the big like millions of listeners, they're you know community focused. So pretty much specifically for the city, for the community, and they're more open to playing like indie artists, up and coming artists and things like that. So I started off doing a journalism internship with them, and one day my editor was like, hey, like, why don't you take some pictures at the concert that you're going to? I'm like, okay, cool. So that pretty much started, um, and I figured out that I like photography. Um, so we have video, we have writing, we have photography, um, and then performance. So that kind of came out of the poetry portion. Um, yeah, so that's basically the introduction. Um, so the I guess well before I really get into it, um, it would be helpful to kind of know what your interests are so I can determine like how to present what I'm going to present. So what like what brought you to this class? Why did you sign up for it? You gave me the awkward look, so I'm going to pick one. Oh. Um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> I mean, I like design and I like law. Uh, so are you more of a designer or are you on the law side? Um, I don't know. I mean, I'm a writer, but I think more recently I've been on the more technical side rather than like the creative side. So. Cool. Um, just, just for a little bit of background context for this particular class, everyone in this class, except for this side of the room, you're basically four months into college, right? And uh, without really, the Washu's plan here is to give people time to figure out what their interests are. So some people might have really concrete interests, and other people might be saying, I don't know, I have no idea, right? That's, is that a fair way to, sounds okay. Oh, cool, so you had your hand up. Um, I don't really know exactly what I'm like majoring in, but I've always found law really interesting, so I just wanted to learn more about it. And I'm not good at design, so I was interested <laughs> to hear more about that too. <laughs> So I guess like to give you a little insight, that's kind of like a trick question because if you would have asked me my first year of college, I would have said, oh, computer science, and then it completely flipped like three semesters later. <laughs> uh, so it is completely okay to not know exactly what you want to do your freshman year of college. And to let you in on a further secret, a lot of my friends actually changed what they wanted to do when they're 30. 
So it's like, oh, I majored in this in college, and then you literally do something entirely different. Like, I wanted to be a, a veterinarian, now I'm a chef. So it's like, it happens. <laughs> uh, so I guess two more people. Mm -hmm. So I eventually wanted to go to law school, so I wanted to like, learn more about law and stuff like that, and I wanted to get hopefully a bit more creative, because I'm not the most creative person. Design isn't like really my thing, so I wanted to learn more about that. No heads now, man. You get to, that's the first lesson of college. If you put your head now, you're getting picked up. I like law. Well, like, not just like something I want to pursue, but like, I've always been like trying to get into it ever since like, I took debate in high school. So I, mean, I was just, so I was like, why not? Cool. Alrighty. Um, so I guess last question. Um, so what do you all know about Ferguson? Like, just. Just, I guess, one or two words, real quick. Um, you. Uh, well, Ferguson is a place in the, they, they had the, the, the shooting that happened and it led to a lot of racially charged events and protests. Okay. Um, yellow shirt right on the corner. Uh, I was going to say the same phrase, racially charged, as well. Um, I mean, we, yeah, we talked about how we read a case um, for the first that lost, um, that they lost it over a long period of time. And um, there's just a lot of, um, yeah, just a lot of events that happened. Hey, okay, um, Platcher. Um, there's more black man on the person. There's this Michael Brown. By Officer Wilson, and so regard like I think there's a lot of like, confusion about what really happened, but it was more important like what it represented. Gotcha. Uh, um, I would say like, I know in a criminal justice sense, there's like 20,000 people living in Ferguson, and there's like, 11,000 arrest warrants in one year, which is like a crazy proportion in comparison to other um, towns and. Okay, uh, so to give you a little further background information about myself, I grew up in a municipality that's about five miles away from Ferguson. Um, well, I guess to backtrack a little bit, so when I was first born and my parents were like in their starter condo, we actually lived in Ferguson. So we lived in a complex that was directly behind where the quick trip was. And then we eventually moved like a few miles away. So pretty much grew up like right around Ferguson. Um, and so at the time of, you know, when everything took place, I actually wasn't in St. Louis. I was in Toronto being like a cool traveling photographer and all that cool stuff. Um, so what made it, what made my perspective unique was the fact that I wasn't here when everything happened. Um, as a lot of my activist friends kind of experienced, you know, as soon as it happened, they're all going to Ferguson. They're, you know, witnessing the protests. They're first starting off. They have this first-hand account as things are building. Whereas for me, you know, I'm a thousand miles away and I'm like, oh, well, Twitter's gonna give me the 411. And so the first thing that I saw on Twitter was the Bernie Quick Trip that everybody pretty much knows. And so about a week later, that's when I made it home and I decided, okay, I kind of want to see what's actually going on for myself because, you know, the Quick Trip, I've been to that Quick Trip on numerous occasions and, you know, of the other businesses that were in that particular area. And so, um, you know, I took pictures, um, some video. And so last year I did what was called um, Living Ferguson with St. Louis Public Radio, the St. Louis NPR affiliate. And so they had a storytelling event to commemorate the five year anniversary of Ferguson. And during that event, they selected a few people to tell different perspectives that was sort of counter to what everybody hears about Ferguson. And so this video that I'm gonna play you is from that particular event. So let's play a little bit and we'll discuss it. <coughs>
was all distracted. <coughs> all my years of living in North Carolina, I had never seen that much traffic going down the shores. I ended up having to park my car in the lot where Walgreens used to be, and I walked a mile all the way from Chambers down to the trip. And as I began to walk, I started to see people that look like me, young black people, riding in their cars. And their radios were really loud, like really, 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 really loud. <laughs> and then I began to notice people were hanging out at windows, they were riding on the rooftops of cars. And I felt this energy that I never knew could exist in that moment. And I began to get excited. I was running, running down the stores and trying to grab every single shot that I get. Every time I pass the car, somebody would yell, Hey, yo, cuz, get this picture. <laughs> yeah. And so I was, I started taking pictures, and I decided that I want to use my long lens so I can get isolation of the subjects with the rest of the background because I wanted to tell a unique story based on those people in that car. So after about 15 minutes of these AO photos, <laughs> and the first thing I noticed was peace. There weren't any riots. There was no fire. There was no tear gas. There wasn't even a clearly contrasted line of people versus the police when I got there. Okay, so um, that's pretty much um, storytelling. So I guess to give you more background about the art of storytelling, so the way you have poetry, the way you have music performance, the way you have theater, there's a type of performance that's called storytelling. And essentially what it is, is giving like a straight non-fiction account of something that happened but making it more so immersive, um, giving um, you know enthusiasm, trying to recreate someone else's excitement, even though that necessarily wasn't your excitement. So just like when I said, someone yelled out, hey, yo, cuz. So even though that wasn't me per se, one of the, the um, one of the tools that I used was basically taking someone else's expression and bringing that into the story. And um, I guess it's like, quick tip about performance is it's a good way to get people's attention, like having contrast and dynamic range. Um, so I guess the most important parts of storytelling, um, one is present, you know, being present in the moment. So let's say you walk into um, a restaurant, you just sit down and you just observe what is going on. Um, what type of seating are you in? Are you in a booth? Are you in, you know, like table with the <coughs> chairs, um, what's the lighting like, you know, is it dimly lit, is it really bright during the daytime, um, how many people are there, um, are the people really loud and talkative because there's like a game going on or are they kind of quiet and it's more of an evening setting. And so it's very important just to be present, just to take time to just think, you know, use your senses, you know, in poetry call it sensory details. Um, what do you feel? What is the texture of the tablecloth? Um, what do you hear? Um, what's the scent? You know, is it like a barbecue place? Is it um, a Mexican restaurant or something like that? Um, and then there's kind of like, I guess, the sixth sense of just feel. Like, what is your feel? Um, do you feel safe? Do you feel comfortable? Do you feel um, uneasy? Um, you know, just things like that. And that's like the very foundation of, you know, telling a story is being able to take in all this information that you're eventually going to communicate to other people. And so once you get to that point, um, the next part is actually creating or crafting your story. Um, so with this, this actually started off as um, kind of a written essay. Since I'm a writer by trade, I like to write everything out first and then rehearse it and practice it. And so as a writer, that kind of gives me a chance to start with the basic elements of beginning, middle, and end. So the beginning, obviously, is how did it start? You know, what happened? How did you end up in a restaurant to begin with? Your middle is sort of, you know, your rising action. Okay, what's happening in the restaurant? You know, did the waiter or waitress approach me? Um, I decided to order some some dish that I ended up hating, like pickles or something like that. 
Um, and then you have your end, like, what was the rest of the shit? Did you get the pickles and say, I hate pickles, I'm never coming here again? Or did you get something that was actually yummy? Um, and so, you know, you basically get, you know, the, the nuts and bolts of it. And then um, you eventually just add, like, the good stuff, you know, the entertaining, the, the colorful words, the colorful language. Um, the dramatic statements that kind of get people's attention and things like that. Uh, so I guess from a perspective of uh, understanding narratives of Ferguson, um, you know, everybody has a story, but if you look at people that have been featured in the news, um, who have been brave enough to actually step up and tell their story, um, just thinking about, you know, how they communicated um, the perspective, you know, are there somebody who was actually on West Florissant and they saw it firsthand? Um, are they telling a secondhand story as, you know, if you're like a news producer on Good Morning Today, I don't even know if that's the actual new show, but we're gonna go with it anyway. If you're a news producer on Good Morning Today, you interview someone about their experience, that in turn becomes a secondhand story. So, you know, it's not, you know, good or bad, it's just being conscious of what your perspective, you know, you telling your own perspective is going to be different from you telling the perspective of your best friend. Um, so, uh, so I guess I'll just roll through the last two minutes of this. It felt like every single black person in the city of St. Louis was there. <laughs> The elders, the young people, the men, the women, the parents with their children up there. It seemed like every single black person in St. Louis was there because something about what Darren Wilson represented had a hold on them. Whether it was the unjust traffic tickets and traffic stops, or whether it was the fact that every last one of us had to show up on one corner in North County just to get the rest of the city to hear us. It was all in love. Yeah. The closer I got to the picture, the more I began to feel this warm embrace of love. That same love led a man to set up a drum set underneath the Quick Trip Pavilion and start playing. It made me feel like I was at the May Day Parade, the way, the way you feel the post the drum line is posting you your body. He was playing along with all the people that were chanting, Hands up, don't shoot! And so originally, I thought I was just going down there to observe, to just hide behind my camera and take pictures. But I felt myself being drawn into that moment. The more we began to chant, it became about us. Mm -hmm. And I realized I was a part of this movie. Every time I pierced my mouth to yell the words, hands up, I could feel the existence of my soul forsaking my body mm -hmm. and connecting with theirs. Yeah. 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 I was so caught up in the euphoria of us that I never even stopped to think about how this needed to be in Hmm. You see, when I looked on social media, I thought I would see flames and broken glass. But there was none of that. There was people just like me, and they were my community. And in that moment, I was glad I decided to come home and capture those moments for my friends and myself. Uh, so, what are some things that you all were able to gather from the video? Start. The way like <clears throat> social media portrayed all of this was not how you experienced it and how like, a lot of people experienced it. So, actually, you know what? We're going to do this grade school style. I'm just going to go around in a circle. That way, everybody gets to talk. Nobody's hiding. Up. So, teaching. Okay, start. Okay, start. Um, I've learned that. Um, there are multiple perspectives to storytelling, and uh, whether you're, you have a first kind of count or a second kind of count, you have a unique perspective. Yeah. I wrote down that you said like, the foundation is information, which I think with the storytelling, which I think is really powerful for like all different kinds of storytelling, and that's how that information is displayed and expressed to people. Um, I like the 
that you use repetitiveness as a form of emphasis. So I noticed you repeated, I forgot the sentence already, twice. And I was like, I heard it the first time, but then when I heard it again, I just, it kind of stuck with me. And I, I told you, like, to, um, if you use other people's Um, I thought it was really interesting how, like, the experience of going, not necessarily to be a part of um, the movement, like, you can still feel like you're a part of it and you'll be fine. I looked at one part that stuck out to me was when we talked about, like, how it felt like every mom was in the North Town was there, and, like, that was what it took to get, like, wider attention and to, like, make sure that you were heard. I like how you like contrasted your story with like the sensationalism you're talking about in the media. Uh, I like how you you brought in the the quotes like the different quotes. Um, I like how you like you presented other people's perspectives, even though it was really just like all observation and wasn't like projected or anything. I like how you like how your voice at different levels to emphasize. Just like the way you told the story, how you had like different energy levels at like, specific like times. And it wasn't just like you know, <coughs> just kind of like the way you told it, like <coughs> it helped us, like it helped me feel like that sense of community, community that you found whatever you were. So it's like I was part of it too. It's just like I'm not just like hearing someone tell you. Yes. But you had like your contrast with like, um, just kind of like when you're telling the story like this. Sort of thing, but then, you know, as you're describing it, it's kind of like your emotion. You can tell like, your emotions are kind of evolving, kind of evolving with the story that's coming along. It's like, oh, it's like, there's something that you're like, also like, a little angry or like, something like that. It's like, you know, like yeah. um, kind of throughout the story, it kind of felt like there's a rising tide of, of energy and emotion throughout it. I was thinking about what it means to perform emotion and the relationship between feeling viscerally the emotion, the adrenaline from performing in front of an audience, and the practice beforehand, and how those three relate to the performative aspect of emotion. And so you all made really good points. And so even though this is like technically a video because it's on YouTube, um, it was actually a radio broadcast. So it's basically, you know, something that you would hear. Um, so there aren't any pictures, there's no video of Ferguson itself. It's solely dependent on what I'm able to communicate. So if you think about, you know, um, someone from the community being interviewed on the news, um, you're solely dependent on what they're actually saying how they're saying it, and then also since it's you know, on the news, what they're wearing, you know, a lot of times the environment or um, what people wearing is kind of another piece of the story. So, you know, if you um, interview someone that's sort of casually dressed, you can say, okay, well, maybe they were doing something really active. You know, obviously if you have like, you know, the, the hands up <coughs> t-shirt, um, you have a sign with you or something like that, that's an additional facet of the story that you're communicating. Um, or if you're, you know, cash, um, dressed in a business or something like that, you know, it's 
you're going to communicate a different perspective. You know, nobody's going to make the assumption that if it's a business person, you're protesting. Even though that could actually be the case, that's kind of just an unconscious bias that a lot of us have. But um, just to underscore the fact that, um, you know, it's ultimately about, in this instance, what you're saying it, how you're saying it, um, the person that's saying it, and also what they're wearing. And so now, I can figure out this Mac yeah. product. So <laughs> these are um, so images. So we're going to transition into the actual visual side of the storytelling. Um, so this was actually like a really interesting image. So this would have been the day after the night that I was describing in the video. And so this was the quick trip that, you know, this so infamously talked about. And so the first thing I kind of noticed with this particular person is the sign he had. And I'm like, wow, like stress pet a dog. And it's just something that, you know, based on tradition or what's been covered in the media, you wouldn't have expected to see that, you know? You would have expected to see people in like tear gas masks and things like that. But actually, um, you know, when all of that wasn't happening, um, it was more so like a communal setting. Um, people actually took the time to make it into um, what they kind of deemed as like the people spark, this sort of communal area where people would bring food water supplies um, it was very a very social environment and so with this person he saw a need for calm and for peace so he brought his care dog to sort of say hey like I actually want to help ease some of the tension that's going on and so um, looking at this image you know there's a lot that you can gather from it so um, I guess from the design perspective you have the hero which would be the man the dog and the sign but then also in the background, you have all the people that are doing different things. And so like, this kid is always like one of the funniest things to me, just like seeing that opera pose that he has. But you kind of just see like, it's a very light environment. Like nobody's really angry. He's just being goofy with, I think like, oh, <coughs> or something like that. So this was, um, a piece of graffiti that was on the back of the utility box that was kind of like directly in front of the quick trip. And so uh, I assume this was like the actual day that Mike Brown was shot or maybe the day after someone took the time to actually write that on there. So what's something that you kind of interpret just from seeing that? Interpretation. So as a communicator of information, so what can we gather from the font or the um, the medium that was used to actually write this message? You know, is it um, something that's neatly pristine, presented in like calibre or something like that? <laughs> you know, so it's um, graffiti. You know, it's being the graffiti tag, and um, you can clearly see that below that, you know, someone started to write Mike Brown or something similar to that, and they kind of cross it out. So how something is actually written, kind of going back to the performance of storytelling, like how you say it is the equivalent to how something is actually written. So you can gather information just from seeing, like, was it aggressively written? Um, did they use spray paint? Did they use Sharpies? Did they take the time to actually make sure everything was kind of like perfectly um, scaled to size? Or did they just kind of write it however? Oh, uh, yeah, I was just going to say it was kind of impulsive. Like someone just like was passing by and was like, okay, like, something needs to go on here. Yeah. Um, this is, I don't know why I'm thinking about the scale. I'm trying to figure out how 
all of the person that wrote it. I'm going to figure out how high this was. So who wrote it? Was it like a younger person or like a super tall person or someone taking a photo of someone's shoulders mm -hmm. or anything? Um, yeah, so I guess it was probably like yay high or something like that. So it's the bottom of the white part or the top? Uh, the top part. So this is like, I think this is where they put like the controllers for like traffic lights and everything like that. So whenever somebody wants to like control the lights, I think that's what kind of box it was. Um, so this is like another one of my favorite images. So this was directly in front of where the last image was. And so I'm just kind of walking around and I see this group of kids playing around and I see like this little boy and this dog and just seeing the joy on his face when he sees this dog is like, oh my God, like, it is. So. Yeah, so. And so I think another thing that kind of stood out to me is the fact that, um, you know, people brought their children out. You know, this wasn't strictly like an 18 and over affair where it was just like all the adults that were protesting. But, um, you know, both during the day and during the nighttime, you know, people will bring their entire families out because one, you know, they're a part of the community too. You know, just because you're 13 doesn't mean you're separate from the community. But also for a lot of people, um, they wanted to explain to their children the gravity of the situation, um, you know, what's actually going on from a parent's perspective because in the age of social media, they're gonna find out one way or another. So, you know, as a parent, a lot of times it's best to actually have that conversation with your children. Um, and then also, what was I gonna say? Um, 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 oh, but, so just like the fact that they're like little kids, you know, these aren't, you know, teenagers or anything like that. But, you know, the environment itself appeared to be safe enough to where people felt comfortable to bring out essentially toddlers. And so that in itself should say something in contrast to what you've seen in the media. You know, would you bring your kids out to like a, a rolling gun battle in Iraq? Mm -hmm. No, you probably wouldn't. Mm -hmm. This kind of looks like a cookout. Like a yeah, cookout. exactly. Like, I'm seeing like back home we have like these ginormous cookouts where it's different families but they all happen to be like black families at the park at the same time and it's not planned but there's like thousands of black people in a park in Long Island at this random time so that's kind of what it looks like it doesn't look like a protest yeah so, it was a, yeah so that's exactly what it was it was yeah. basically a cookout people literally brought like giant barbecue grills <laughs> and stuff like that so um, and then you have I guess like the street racing culture, if you will. So, yeah, like people just doing burnouts in the street. And, you know, if anybody's kind of familiar with, I guess, like racing culture, burnouts are very, like, celebratory or, like, lax. You know, you're not running from the police. You know, you can't run from the police if your tire is spinning the smoke. Um, and then also you can kind of see people just like lined up up and down West Forest and, and so you know it's not like the police were saying get off the street or anything like that. And so I guess that goes to the, um, what was it, the five second move. Mm -hmm. So this was actually prior to the implementation of that rule and it's my guess that this is sort of where that started from. So in the, uh, probably like the first week or two after um, the death of Mike Brown, people were kind of just lying. <coughs> sides of West Forest <coughs> and it was very much like this kind of like party environment and so at that particular time you know nobody the police that weren't really coming and saying hey like you have to move or anything like that with the exception of being in the middle of the street um, because sometimes they'll say hey that's, that's like a safety issue you might get hit by a car like a police officer said that to me taking pictures um, but still like the people that are actually on the shoulder you know the police weren't really saying anything to them about that so a lot of that didn't really happen probably until like maybe week three or something like that. So I guess when they felt like, okay, it's time to kind of put a lid on this thing because it's dragging on too long. And so I guess from like a legal perspective, in my personal opinion, I feel like legislation or law can kind of come when people are ready to kind of to shut something down. So it can kind of go on or it can exist for a period of time. And if they don't feel that it's going to naturally um, rectify itself or it's going to rectify itself in a way that's satisfactory to their perspective, then that's when you will get legislation like, okay, you can't stand stationary for five seconds or something like that. 
Um, so this was um, the drummer that I mentioned. So this was like by far like the most fascinating thing to me, just seeing this person that brought an entire drum set to the quick trip. And yeah, so he's just like sitting there playing and everybody's like chanting. It's like a club. And so, you know, I'm sitting there with my camera like, oh my God, this is like amazing just being caught up in the mood, the moment, but then also trying to take pictures. Um, and I guess from another note, so this was like pitch black, so the power had been turned off at the quick trip, so it's like completely dark, and it's really hard to take pictures when it's pitch black. You basically just like spray and pray and hope you get something good. And so luckily I got a good shot out of you. Mm -hmm. And so we have two young ladies riding on the rooftop of the car, which was something I thought was just kind of intriguing because, you know, um, like in my lifetime prior to Ferguson, like you see it occasionally, like um, at parades or um, like weekend random hangouts or stuff like that. But this was the first time that I kind of saw it in mass. If you have like, you know, six people in one car and, you know, four people are actually sitting down, but then two people are riding on the roof or something like that. And I think it's kind of, um, you know, celebratory with also, you know, kind of wanting to be seen. So. And that is the last image. So, um, Q&A time, questions. Yes. Do you take all your photographs in black and white? No, so these were actually originally taken in color and I converted them to black and white. And so the story with these images is um, I use what was called like a Nikon D5000. So it's kind of a very consumer level camera. You know, it's not anything that a professional journalist would be using. And so from a personal perspective, um, knowing that it wasn't a professional camera, there was kind of this sense of like insecurity, like, oh my God, like I know my images can be way better. And so I literally um, like did look at these pictures for a year. So the first time I actually saw my own pictures other than uploading them to my computer was in 2015. Yeah, 2015. And so after that kind of initial, I guess, insecurity wore off, I kind of saw, uh, you know, the beauty of, um, the beauty of like noise or grain as we call it in the photography world or the, um, uh, the flaws, like sometimes, you know, we feel very insecure about flaws, but your flaws can be actually what sells the story. Um, you know, if you're telling a story about your experience in Ferguson and you're very shaky, you're very, uh, your voice cracking and everything like that, that actually adds an additional layer to your story. You know, it conveys emotion. And I think that's one of the things that, um, you know, even like the most professional people have it you know, trouble getting over it because in our minds, whenever we're presenting something to other people, we expect perfection. But sometimes it's that imperfection that kind of, you know, makes you feel it, that gives you that emotional connection. Um, next question. Um, so, um, all of like the pictures that you took obviously showed like some very like peaceful protesters and showed like how, you know, it was like a cookout, you know? Um, or like at some point there had been someone who lit the quick trip on fire yes. and used like violence, right? So was there any kind of tension between those who chose to be like peaceful protesters? Like did they have feelings about those who were the more violent protesters? Because they kind of allowed the media to like take hold of the story. Oh uh, yeah, so there absolutely was. Uh, you know, there are, you know, in any situation there are gonna be varying perspectives and so uh, one perspective which I showed in these images were sort of the peaceful people that had an interest in seeing a de-escalation or resolution but then you also had the people that were more so upset so they're the people that you know they want action now by any means necessary they were the people that wanted to confront the police directly and then outside of that you had the vandals you know the people that wanted to set the quick trip on fire that wanted to break windows and so it's just like really interesting being in an environment with all three of those types of people. 
um, just even, you know, being out there at nighttime, you know, I was kind of, I wasn't like in the middle of all the like tear gas and all that kind of by choice, but I was there at kind of the in-between time when the peaceful people were kind of leaving and then all the vandals were coming. And so I remember just kind of like hanging out with a group of friends and then next thing you know, somebody drives up and like breaks a window on the store. And so it's kind of like, you know, all going on. And so, and I guess that's what makes it such a, a complex issue because there are so many different perspectives. You know, there was the person of persons who actually did set the quick trip on fire. There was the person of persons that, you know, wanted everybody to be happy and they didn't care what the actual verdict was. So. Next question. Um, so are any of you from St. Louis by chance? Um, have you been through Ferguson? Uh, before all this happened, I'm from Kansas City, so we oh, took a mm -hmm. like, uh, middle school trip to St. Louis, and we just happened to go to Ferguson. But that was before mm -hmm. these things happened. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question? Yes. So you mentioned um, when you were taking the photos, your desire to isolate the subjects from the background yes. and um, sort of capture the emotion. What was the hope in doing that? Um, so, I guess starting with photography, so we have what are called um, you know, wide angle lenses, which give you a wide field of view, and then we have narrow lenses, which give you a narrow field of view. Uh, so, to go back to this image. Here. So this was taken with a wider angle lens. And so one of the benefits of doing this is not only do you get your subject, but you get the background, which provides context. So you can <coughs> see this person is standing in front of the picture with all these people that are around. So that gives you, you know, an additional story. So if you thought about it in terms of like an essay format, that would be saying that, okay, you know, I was in the restaurant and then in addition to me being in the restaurant, there was my friend Joe, there was this group of strangers, there was the waiter, this other business guy and everything like that. But then as we go into this, which was taken with a longer lens that sort of isolates the subject, our attention now becomes more narrow. So you can't really focus on the fact that we were near the quick trip. You're focused more so on the fact of what was going on with this individual person and the people that are immediately surrounding them. So going back to the restaurant, that would be like saying, okay, this is who's sitting at my table. It's me, my friend Joe, and Sue. And we're not thinking about who else is in the restaurant. So that's you know, another tool with storytelling of you know, how wide do you want your focus to be or how narrow do you want it to be. Can I ask you about motive as the storyteller coming into you? As you're driving back, coming back to town and thinking I want to capture something. What, I mean, there are so many people who are trying to convey so many different stories yes. at the time. And I, I was, like you, I was, in, I was on my way out of town for a year when this happened, but because of because I teach and write in criminal law, protest law, I get a, I got a lot of media calls, and I got media calls from, among other things, Chinese state television and Russian state television that wanted to cover Ferguson. And I actually called some Russia expert friends, and I said, should I talk? They said, do not talk to Russian media. It's just not. You know, because but, but it was very clear that they were their motives coming in were were not just what's the story. They wanted to frame it in a certain way. So yes. as you came back, did you have? Did you say, I want to see what I see? Or did you say, I really want to have a passion for framing this in a certain way? Oh uh, yeah, so pretty much two specific motives. Um, the first motive was just see what I see. So coming from a journalism background, um, I'm very objective. Like, okay, like how are things, you know, what is it in its natural state without sort of, you know, telling this slant or kind of giving a perspective. <coughs> then also, uh, my other motive was to tell a different story. So the year before Ferguson, I actually worked with um, a couple of different um, labor organizations that did some protest photography. And so back then, there would be maybe one or two people with cameras and then a couple of the news outlets. And so you kind of have like this very limited, um, you know, group of people that have the ability to tell the story visually, 
but then you get to Ferguson, you know, with the advent of technology, cell phones, the availability of cameras, everybody has the ability to tell a story. So you have, you know, the um, like one of my friends lived down the street from uh, the Quick Trip. You know, he can go out with his camera phone and say, okay, this is my personal perspective of walking from my front door to the Quick Trip. This is what I see. Um, you also have maybe someone that's like on a studio newspaper that's like, okay, you know, I'm an inspiring journalist. I want to tell my perspective from that particular standpoint. Um, you also have the person that's from outside of St. Louis that's like, I know absolutely nothing about St. Louis. I kind of need to learn the context, but also kind of tell the story within that limited context that I have. And so for me, and then also being like an artist, like I'm used to being different, being an individual. And so my thought process is like, okay, like what can I do that's different than all the other people? You know, obviously whenever you have some type of conflict, people always want to talk about the conflict. Um, you know, in the news business, they used to, they literally live by this phrase, if it bleeds, it bleeds. Like, you know, if something blows up, it's like, oh, what's going on the front page? That's the most important thing. But people kind of forget about, okay, like what happened before something blew up? Or what happens to people that didn't want to participate in all the, the mass um, violence, looting and all that that was going on. And so kind of being conscious, and then it's also helped by not being in St. Louis, that gave me the distance to sort of make the decision because had I actually been here, I probably would have been one of those people that's like, oh, like flames and fire, let's go. So, Um, is there any other questions you can find in? One more. One more. Uh, this will be a quick one, but just, uh, like, sorry, this was like half one. Okay. Again, but, uh, so it's been like five years or more. Um, what do you think is like, or how do you think about like continuing this work? Or like, what do you think is like the importance and relevance of continuing to like foster this? Um, so from my perspective, and I very much credit this to the distance that I had prior to starting it, I was able to look at it from more of a historical context as opposed to an immediate context. So um, a lot of the friends that I had that were in the media business, they were more so interested in, you know, the instant, um, the instant story that was there. So I know a lot of people that sold images to um, St. Louis American, the Post Dispatch, or different publications, just to say, hey, this is going on today or this week, like it's important, it's urgent, it's now. But for me, kind of seeing like, okay, well, one, I wasn't even there on day one, so I've already missed out on the opportunity. But two, kind of seeing like, hey, like this is a big deal. Like, you know, I've lived in North County all my life, and I've never seen anything like this. And also, you know, having, you know, um, you know, being a college educated person that's fond of history and kind of seeing the correlation between, um, you know, the riots and watch after the uh, beating of Rodney King or, you know, anything that happened during the 60s or before that, kind of seeing this correlation of like, okay, this is like a really big thing that's going to continue to go on. And, you know, that was kind of like from, you know, the first year, I'm like, okay, that's kind of what's going to happen. And essentially, that kind of is what happened. So during the five-year anniversary, we did efforts from St. Louis Public Radio to tell, you know, a more localized, different perspective. And I think, um, you know, it's something that's going to continue on. So, you know, when the 10-year anniversary comes, it's going to be the same thing. Like, okay, well, we've already seen, um, you know, the guy throwing the tear gas canister back at the police and everything like that. Like, what did we miss? And, you know, if you think about the 60s, there are narratives that are still coming out that we didn't get a chance to see either because um, people were too shy to talk about them because the noise was too loud for their story to get through. Thank you.